Hello again, it's me. This is me. I have a website and I have lovely Inkscape graphics. So, a little bit of background. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, so a little, little bit of a confession to make. I am actually previously a Windows software developer. I worked with Oracle and a whole lot of other lovely enterprise things and this was my work environment, a really, really small 800 by 600 Windows XP single monitor, really thin client. And I really didn't have a whole lot that I could do or change with it, except the background, which is this wonderful t-shirt. And that's all I could do to try to make my environment just that little bit better. Let me smile for the camera. Oh dear. Okay. So, this particular image is really nice. The different, I had at the time a laptop with a slightly higher resolution than I had the really small one. So, given I'm a Windows developer, how do you think I actually made this background work on all the different screen resolutions that I had? This is an input question. Anyone? Windows manipul image manipulation, what is the program you use? Microsoft Paint. Microsoft hey. Paint, thank you. I was being facetious, damn me. <laughs> Sorry, you missed the disclaimer at the front. Unless I call for input, please don't give the game away because there may be some things that, yes. But that was an actual, hey, audience participation. Um, I do actually have a mechanism in my bag if things get too rowdy. <laughs> it's not that. Okay, so to make a wallpaper, if you have your base image, you need to resize it move the base image to where you want it, and then fill in the remaining background. This is really simple stuff. Kind of, well, I thought it was simple at the time. So, in Paint, you find your base image, you resize it, you move it, and then you fill it in. So you can do a whole lot of keyboard shortcuts for this sort of thing, such as with the original Paint. I believe the new Windows 8 version may still do this, but if you hit print screen and then hit paste and then undo that, it will keep the same resolution so you don't have to manually key in the size. Those kind of shortcuts were really cool. Then I started doing Linux stuff and Ubuntu and at one point I had a VM that all I was using it for was just for paint. So I really needed a better solution. Also one that wasn't manual. So, audience participation. How do you do image manipulation in Linux on a command line? Magic. Image magic! Ta-da! <laughs> so, this exact same process with all the clicking and the dragging and the controlling and the pasting can be done in image magic. You can resize it. Small problem. It's actually rescaling the image. I really like having a crisp asset in the bottom right corner of my screen that hasn't got weird pixelations or JPEG artifacts, so I really don't want to be stretching it. You can use Extent, however, which will resize it, except the order there is important because it's actually resizing and then sort of adding more to the canvas that you have. So if you flip that around, you get the same image, but the canvas size changes. And then you can add gravity, so that happens in the opposite direction of where your asset is, so you can make it in one of the corners that you like. Final step, filling in that background, because I know the background color, which just happens to be the hex color of my wonderful t-shirt here, I can fill it in instead of being transparent or white, or in that case, red, I can change it to the color that I want. So I get an image in the command line. I thought this was really cool because some of this stuff uh, with the, the, the things and doing the converts and all this stuff, it's just like, oh my god, command line. This was going back about three years ago now. The original Windows screenshot was about seven years ago. So I'm evolving and learning and it's great. Ta-da, as it were. So you can have your extent, your resize, your gravity, your background, you can have your original image and your new <coughs> image and it's all great. But how do you get that pesky little hexadecimal background colour? Any guesses? Audience participation, how do you programmatically pick a colour from an image in a Linux command line? Anyone? I'll give you a hint. We've had this same answer before. Microsoft Paint. 
<laughs> Image magic. <laughs> Microsoft Paint. No, 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 no. There shouldn't be any more windows, I think, in this talk. I'm not actually sure. Um, no, you can use it in image magic because not only is there convert, but there's um, identify and mogrify. But convert actually has this wonderful thing where you can send in an input image and it has all these under documented functionalities. So you can actually create a histogram of all the different colors. This really doesn't work though because then I would have to somehow manipulate that image in order to work out what was the highest line. But you can change the format to be a list of all the colors. So 255, 255, 255 all multiplied together has all the different possible combinations of RGB. This list though is a little bit long, just, just a little bit. Um, doing W, C, uh, hyphen L and all this stuff, this is literally how I learned to do that. And it's just like, oh my God, Linux, everything's just getting more proper. So this is why I didn't want the audience participation because the next slide, how do you get this list into something more usable? You can format it using a, a mogrify command where you reduce the color count down to 16 and then count all the pixels. And then to get that in a usable format, you can sort it, making it, telling it that the first number will be a number, please use it as an actual number, not a string. And then you can take the first record and then you can do some cutting and some chopping and you can actually get that hexadecimal in one command so you can find that color on the command line programmatically. Can you guess where this is going? <laughs> because we can combine all that together into a nice little shell script. I've got, all these slides will be on the link at the end so you can copy all this down and show me how completely vulnerable it is. Um, <laughs> yes, um, and you can make an image and it's awesome because you can do fancy things like having the input parameters make in your file name and wonderful scripting things. So what I did was I wrapped this shell command in a bit of Ruby and Rails and turned it into a website. Can you guess what's wrong with that? Those back ticks you really do not want in a rail system. But this thing I thought was cool. This was going back about two years ago now. You can have uploads and your bootstrap 3.0 I believe at the time and you can have your upload images and you can have previews and then you can have all your resolutions and it's all great. So what this was doing was I gave it an image that would upload from my machine and then from a predefined series of standard resolutions would automatically resize them, re-upload them and then serve them as images and that's all great. But there's just one problem that process of getting that one image is really tedious now because I have to go and find the image and have it there on my thing and then click the button and do the uploading. So why not get all of them? If, as you may have guessed, this is a t-shirt. This is from a company called Threadless who do a whole lot of really awesome designs and there's artist uh, feedback systems and people make money and it's all great. They also have a really, really nice CMS that has really clearly defined lists of all their bucket images. So every single image is just one little number away from the next one and the resolution's all in that URL there. So I can do a 4i in 0 to 1000 wget and then run it through that and then get all the wallpapers. So I did that. Um, I ran up a small VPS because I work from a hosting company and I can get VPSs for free because I work there. And I made four gigabytes of this wallpaper and I hosted it all. And so instead of just having an upload in the gallery, there's now a cache with all the images and each of the image now has more resolutions. So it was quite a big system. Another thing that I wanted to do because this is all corporate, kind of stuff, there's creators and there's money involved. I did actually want to attribute any of the things that I had up here. So I made another script because about this time I was using Capybara and RSpec and automated usability testing in Ruby. So I made a script that walks each page with that whole one to 550 thing, 550, 500, yeah, all the things walks through and goes, see this div and see this thing. I want to copy that name and I want to copy the designer. I want to copy this and then I want to dump it all in a file and then I'll use that to have attributions all dynamically. 
I also learned a whole lot about UTF-8 encoding here because some people had weird little accents and a whole lot of Ruby crashes later made me realize that that kind of thing is important. So this is a whole learning process. This is just something I've been sort of hacking at for ages and I've learned so much. Who can see the problem here though? Audience participation. I'm sorry, what? I know it's not, but I'm not actually making any money from this and I am linking back to the place where you can give the money and I'm trying not to be too bad. Please don't sue me. I won't tell you. Thank you. Um, yes, there's, there's one thing wrong here. Remember how I said that I was converting all the images and doing that all manually? That's actually not a valid resolution. So I had about half a gig of images up there that were wrong. Uh, that's all being taken down now because of security issues and such. The code is somewhere, but I really don't want to sort of reinforce that whole back tick thing. So, how do you prevent user error? You let them do it themselves. If anyone is doing any sort of CSS or wonderful HTML design work, there's this really awesome system called Place Kitten where you can give it a height and a width and it will give you back a picture of those specific things as a placeholder. So if you're doing mock-ups or something, you don't have to try to create your own placeholder images until you get your assets and such. So I saw this and I'm like, woo, user define height and width. So now I have my final iteration or the most recent iteration of this, which allows you to define at runtime the height and the width of the image that you want and dynamically generates it for you. This is all running on OpenShift and it was great because I had a small little issue with the code that I'll describe later that I was actually fixing during Katie Miller's talk about OpenShift and it just worked and I've been able to have this all running. So this does actually work and I'm going to demonstrate it now. I have a, an API, this is all on my Subdomain, so you can do subdomain mapping and such in OpenShift, so it doesn't have to be the um, RH Cloud domain. But I can click on a thing, and here's a list of the available wallpapers. If my, oh come on, this was working, I swear. Okay, so this top one is something that we are familiar with. The network connectivity in this room is a bit horrid. Um, and I've got these little links which are just suggestions about the different sizes that you want. So you can click on one and what this will do is if the image already exists, it just reserves it so I shouldn't be exploding disk space as much. And then we have an image and it's all really nice and you can change things, say if you want this to be a two instead because you have a double widescreen or something, it will actually, that will break because I demoed this at work and somebody's like, oh, I'll try this, 9999999 crash. Um, one terabyte JPEG images running through Mogrify really doesn't work. <laughs> However, I have validation in there, so I won't actually let you do anything larger than 4K resolutions because who exactly has a 4K resolution? Um, another problem with this, so if I was to click that, it will get those parameters, make it all, dump it into the writable data file directory so when I do more deployments of this, this data isn't lost. And there's a nice widescreen version. Yay, it worked. This is amazing. And this one, and this one. So yes, I can have wonderful dynamically generated things which can be WGOT and all that other kind of fun stuff. So future features. Um, there's a whole lot that Mogrify and Convert and all those little command line things do, including this particular base image here. Um, there's actually another one that I could demonstrate if I wanted to show you the horrible hacky error message that I just made like half an hour ago. The background algorithm that I'm using to do this is the most populous color out of the entire grid when you convert it down to 16 colors. Some don't actually follow that when you've got, say, an image that's mostly filled up the entire system, you might not be able to get that color correct. I was trying another method where I would check that color and see whether it matches the top right, top left pixel, so the one that's coordinate zero, zero. And if that doesn't match, my app was exploding. Now it doesn't explode, it says a nice error message saying, hi, this may not work, and doesn't actually present you an image at all. 
not, not really a RESTful API though, um, but there's a whole lot of other things you can do. You can say take the, the strips of all of them or you can do another convert command which is dash trim which will work out the dead space and then convert it down and if you get the color before you convert it down and do all these fancy things. Also, if I press this button, that's a screenshot. For some reason that's actually a fairly good representation of how that resolution matches my second desktop resolution. In Ubuntu, this if you, if you have separate monitors, you actually get this great big black space. That is all hiding in a dot monitors config XML file somewhere in the system. So what I want to do is be able to pull that from the system and work out where those images have to be placed because otherwise you can't do separate widescreen wallpapers at all in Ubuntu and I've actually got a bug with Cinnamon about this because they won't let you just span it so I have to create my own app to be able to make wallpapers and it's just horrible. Anywho, um, this code is all available on JPROC, only the latest iteration because I'm really worried about security vulnerabilities and stuff. The website is um, so jiproc.glazen.com and there's a cat at the end because I'm done unless there's any questions. <laughs> you can just watch him for a whole lot of loops, he'll just sit there. <laughs> okay, that's done. Thank you very much. Unless there are any questions with our runabout mic, I am done and early, so we might be able to make up time. No one's volunteering. No, no, this is the part where audiences are allowed to participate again. Oh, there's one up the front. Run. I, I can repeat the question if we don't have a, enough time to do the run. Uh, Oh, run. Run, run. <laughs> Hi. So are you still using the image uh, magic command line in the latest version or are you moving over to using one of the, the Ruby APIs that will talk to the same core? I've actually got a fork of one of the Ruby wrappers for convert which does a whole lot of the sanitation of content but it still ends up just calling system commands. It's called image sorcery as opposed to image magic. And so what I was just doing then is the latest commit is actually fixing this extra function that I added to that to work out that top pixel. So I have actually got a fork of all that, but it's still not the best. And unless somebody in raw Ruby was able to do image manipulation, I still think that like a sort of sane um, community vetted way to make sure that all the inputs for that particular command string is okay. I think that's the most secure I can get, even though there's still back ticks in the code. Sorry. Mm, I've got some Perl code if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got Windows. <laughs> I, I do because if anyone was noticing, the first image in my slides here is actually the Bliss Hill. Fun, fun story, this, this hill, the Windows XP background default, was the only hill in this whole area of California without vineyards. And the guy went back and now it's all vineyards again. So I'm not sure what that says about Windows, the fact that it's now all wine. Yes. Image. <laughs> See? Yes. Thank you. I'll be here just for tomorrow. I used to be able to say all week, but now it's like last day. Oh, sad. Um, yes. Any other questions or are we going to do the whole shuffle roo? No? Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much.